So what is the gut microbiome? So the gut microbiome is your ecosystem of trillions of bacteria that line your digestive tract. It's controlled by your diet, your exposures, and even your stress level. So human beings are actually holobiomes, which means we're made out of trillions of living organisms inside of us. In fact, there's so much bacteria inside of our digestive tract, if you were to weigh it out, it would weigh three pounds, which is the same as the human brain. So what determines our microbiome? So it begins with your genetics. So the microbiome of your mother and your father. Then your birth method. So if you were born by vaginal delivery, you get exposed to the bacteria going through the birth canal. So unfortunately, uh, children born by C-section don't get that same exposure to the mother's vaginal uh, bacteria. But what I understand in a lot of hospitals now, they're actually swabbing down C-section babies with the mother's vaginal bacteria to kind of replicate going through the birth canal because they know that bacteria is so important for the microbiome. So breastfeeding. So when an infant breastfeeds, they get exposed to all the protective immunoglobulins which are present in breast milk. And that is so beneficial for the microbiome. Your diet, so if someone eating a standard American diet is gonna have a completely different microbiome from someone eating a clean, organic, whole foods diet. Exercise, so it's fascinating, but research is showing that exercise has its own positive influence on the microbiome, separate from diet and exposures. Your exposures, so if you're exposed to antibiotics, you know, prescription medications, if you're on long-term acid suppressive medications or synthetic hormones, that can all affect the microbiome. And then stress, so if you're chronically stressed and your cortisol is high, cortisol is the bad stress hormone, then that's gonna also have an influence on the type of bacteria growing in your gut. So all disease begins in the gut. This was once said by Hippocrates. So the gut microbiome can really determine your overall health. Your gut microbiome could be controlling your weight, your metabolism, your immune system, your skin, your hormones, and even your mood. So a lot of research is evolving on the gut microbiome. You know, having an overabundance of certain bacteria or an imbalance can lead to something called dysbiosis. And dysbiosis can cause many systemic health issues. It can cause IBS, autoimmune disease, mood disorders, chronic fatigue, and chronic pain. Microbiome disruption is also linked to more common conditions like high blood pressure, diabetes, high cholesterol, arterial plaque buildup, Alzheimer's disease, rheumatoid arthritis, and even mental health diseases like bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, and more. Colon cancers and other cancers are also linked to dysbiosis in the gut. Children who have microbiome issues are more likely to, to develop food allergies. And adults who have microbiome disruption are more likely to develop food sensitivities. A lot of times, once we heal the microbiome, a lot of the food sensitivities go away. So does our gut affect our brain? So scientists are now recognizing something called the gut-brain axis. So a significant portion of your neurotransmitters, like serotonin and dopamine, are actually made in your gut. So that's why they sometimes refer to your gut as the second brain. So that's why when your gut is having problems, like bloating, constipation, abdominal pain, your mood will often suffer as well. So many patients who have IBS are actually thought to have a deficiency of serotonin in the gut which is why in conventional medicine, they treat a lot of IBS patients with antidepressant medications. And these medications raise the serotonin level, not simply in the brain, but also in the gut as well. So in my practice, when I see a patient who has anxiety or depression, I always ask about their gut health. You know, what are they eating? How are they digesting their food? How are their bowel movements? If they're constipated or bloated, they could be having microbiome issues that are leading to an imbalance of the neurotransmitters which are causing their mood symptoms. 
So many times, once we correct their digestive issues and get them to have regular bowel movements and a healthier microbiome, their mood symptoms resolve as well. Okay, so there was a review article that came out in 2018 in the Journal of Neuropsychobiology, and there is a link to the full article on my website, but this was a very fascinating article. It talked about how important nutrition and the gut microbiome are for healthy mood. So science and research is now supporting the importance of the gut-brain axis. So why are the bacteria in our gut so important? Well, it's because they eat what we eat. And depending on what we eat, we can influence the type of bacteria that are growing in our gut. So food influences the microbiome. So the bacteria use the food that we eat and they break it down into bioactive substances. So the type of diet we're eating can change the chemicals that are being released by the bacteria into our body. And these are chemicals that determine our weight our immune system, our metabolism, our hormones, our skin, and even our mood. So for example, there's research that's been done on obese mice and thin mice. What happens when they transplant the bacteria from the obese mice into the thin mice? The thin mice become obese. And vice versa, when they transplant the bacteria from the thin mice into the obese mice, the obese mice will lose weight and become thin. Isn't that fascinating? So when I see a patient in my practice who's really struggling with their weight, and when I review their diet and their exercise, it's pretty impeccable. They're doing a great job. That's when we have to look at their gut microbiome because maybe there's something there that's causing them to hold on to the weight. So the bacteria in your gut can even control some of your cravings because the bacteria live off the foods that you're eating. So if you have some bad bacteria in your gut that are living off the sugar and dairy in your diet, you're gonna continue to crave those foods. So that's why making that initial change in your diet can be so difficult. So skin is often a reflection of your microbiome. So when I look at a patient's face, I often get a little window into their gut microbiome. You know, patients who are overindulging in sugar, fast foods, or alcohols, tend to have more dull skin with blemishes and sometimes even a little swelling in the face. You know, acne is a bacterial imbalance on the skin that often um, is a reflection of a bacterial imbalance in the gut. Similarly, rosacea, which is the redness that you get on the cheeks and your nose, that is often linked to gut microbiome issues and like a sensitivity to sugars and carbohydrates in the diet. Now the great news is that when a patient cleans up their diet, within a few weeks to a few months, we see such a drastic difference in their skin and in their face. And that's a reflection of their gut microbiome getting healthier as well. So what disrupts the gut microbiome? So sugar is a big disruptor of the gut microbiome. So by sugar, I mean refined sugar. Sugar feeds all the bad bacteria in the gut, the kind that cause inflammation, weight gain, and trigger more sugar cravings. Artificial sugars are also bad for the gut microbiome since they often feed some of the bad bacteria in your gut that cause dysbiosis. So a lot of artificial sugars, for example, xylitol, mannitol, sorbitol, they can't be absorbed by the body, but that leaves it in your gut for the bacteria to have a field day and ferment that into gas and cause bloating. So far, only stevia is considered safe on the gut, but even that I recommend to use sparingly because I have seen patients who are really sensitive and get digestive distress when they use products with stevia. So alcohol is bad for the gut microbiome because it turns into sugar. And that's why a lot of times we'll see skin symptoms flare. For example, someone with rosacea will see that flare when they indulge in a lot of sugar or alcohol. Antibiotics, so antibiotics are powerful tools. You know, they're very helpful to kill bad bacterial infections in our body. But the downside is that they also kill some of the good bacteria in our gut. You can also be exposed to antibiotics if you're eating conventionally raised poultry, meats, and dairy products. So this is another reason why it's so important to be uh, selective in, and only use antibiotics when absolutely necessary. A lot of times antibiotics are over-prescribed sometimes for viral infections when they're not really necessary. 
So in my practice, I'm very judicious in prescribing antibiotics only when I feel absolutely necessary. And I always remind my patients to take probiotics along, alongside the antibiotics to protect the good bacteria in the gut. So one example of antibiotics throwing off the microbiome will be when a woman takes antibiotics for something and three days later, she has a vaginal yeast infection. That's something we see very commonly. And it's because the antibiotics threw off the gut microbiome, which then threw off the vaginal microbiome. So non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. So these are NSAIDs. Examples are like ibuprofen, Aleve, naproxen. So these medications are very hard on the gut. And interestingly, they're, they're called anti-inflammatory drugs, but they're actually inflammatory on the gut lining. Synthetic hormones, so these are like the hormones present in birth control pills. So these can also affect the gut microbiome. So this is why a lot of times when women start birth control pills, they gain weight and they feel really bloated. So my preference in my practice is to use bioidentical hormones. And the nice thing with that is we can often use that topically. So in a patient who's having a lot of gut issues, bloating issues, I will just prescribe the hormones topically so they don't even go through your gut. Okay, acid suppressive medications. So if you've been on Prilosec or Omeprazole or Prevacid for a long time, and there's a lot of people who have been on them for five, 10, or 20 years, that can definitely change your gut microbiome because that's gonna change how you break down proteins in your diet. Infections, so if you have a gut infection with a parasite, a yeast, a virus, any of these can affect your microbiome. Stress, so again, cortisol, the bad stress hormone is gonna influence the type of bacteria that grow in your gut. Pesticides can affect your microbiome. GMO foods, so genetically modified foods. So when an insect eats a GMO crop, do you know what happens? its intestines explode. So imagine what happens in humans, especially in sensitive individuals. You know, over time, all that GMO wheat, corn, soybean oil, really take a toll on the gut. Can lead to um, chronic disease such as irritable bowel syndrome, autoimmune disease, chronic fatigue, and other chronic diseases. So inflammatory oils, so by this I mean the vegetable oils. So corn oil, soybean, canola. These are, can definitely cause inflammation in the gut. And we see such improvement when patients cut it out of their diet. We see improvement in hormones. You know, a lot of women will tell me their menstrual cramps are significantly improved. And we also see a lot of improvement in skin as well. So chemical disinfectants. So these are like soaps, detergents, cleaning chemicals, even mouthwashes. So this is why, if possible, it's preferable to use more natural household cleaners like baking soda, vinegar, and essential oils whenever possible. And then finally, surgery. So if you have surgery on your gut, like you have your gallbladder removed, or your appendix removed, or you're going through bariatric surgery for weight loss, all of these can affect your microbiome. So what improves the microbiome? So eating a clean, organic diet with lots of vegetables is so good for the microbiome. Fermented foods. So these are foods that naturally have good bacteria because the fermentation process allows bacteria to grow. So these are like sauerkraut, kimchi, kefir. There's actually dairy kefir and there's also coconut kefir for people who are dairy sensitive. Interaction with the soil, the earth, and pets is also beneficial to the microbiome. Sometimes taking a probiotic supplement, again, probiotics are the good bacteria for your gut, can be so helpful to the microbiome. Fiber, so in addition to getting your fiber from your diet and your vegetables, sometimes patients do benefit from additional fiber as a supplement, and that can help as well. Exercise, so like I mentioned, research is showing exercise has its own beneficial impact on your gut bacteria. And finally, having a good circadian rhythm, meaning you go to bed on time and you wake up on time with the sun, that is also important for a healthy gut microbiome. So should I take a probiotic? So this is a question that I'm often asked. So probiotics are the good bacteria for your gut. Some examples of this are like lactobacillus, bifidobacterium, and the yeast probiotic called Sarcomyces boulardii. 
So it really depends on your symptoms. So if you're having symptoms of digestive imbalances, such as heartburn, irregular bowel habits, bloating, abdominal pain, then I'll generally recommend a probiotic. If there's a suspicion that there's a microbiome issue, such as a patient who's seeing me for acne or recurrent vaginal yeast infections, then I'll definitely recommend probiotics. Sometimes we do hold off on probiotics until after the patient has submitted a gut microbiome test, which I'll talk about today. So there are different doses of probiotics depending on your symptoms. So if I sense that the patient really needs a gut microbiome reboot, I will give them a pretty strong probiotic. We'll do like 225 billion colony forming units, five or more strains, and it'll typically have something called arabinogalactans, which are the prebiotic seeds to help recolonize and reboot the microbiome. For treating minor digestive imbalances, I'll do like 100 billion colony forming units, five or more strains. And then for just maintaining a healthy gut, we'll typically do like 20 billion, five or more strains. So prebiotics are the food for the probiotics. So prebiotics are the fiber that's found in vegetables and fruits. So for example, apples, bananas, they have prebiotic fiber. The issue is that prebiotics in supplement form or in health bars can be a problem for a lot of patients who have bloating issues. And if a patient um, has a lot of bloating, and I suspect they may have SIBO, which I'm gonna talk about today. SIBO is small intestine bacterial overgrowth. These are patients who need to avoid supplements with prebiotics. And sometimes a lot of health bars put it in their ingredient list as inulin or chicory root because it helps to raise their fiber level, but these things cause a tremendous bloating for these patients. So fermented foods are a great way to get natural probiotics from food. So again, this is like sauerkraut, kimchi, kefir. Even if you eat one or two tablespoons a day, it does help your microbiome. And then fiber is so important for the probiotics to, to thrive because your gut bacteria live off the fiber in your diet. So I always encourage patients, start with your diet, eat lots of vegetables, and then sometimes we do add additional fiber. Thank you.